all know what a wake-up call is, right? Some of you had a really big one this morning when you could feel that hour less of sleep than you normally get. I was so worried about that, I had three alarms going today. I was like, oh man, I just do not want to mess this up. Um, I set one on my phone because I knew the phone, in theory, is supposed to change time. I was afraid I'd forget to change the time on my alarm clock. So then I still changed it, and I still didn't trust it, so I just kept all the alarms going. But wake-up calls, those are, those are not always fun, but they're important. Uh, I've, I get to talk to people all the time. I talked to somebody today that reminded me they never have to use an alarm. They just get up uh, because I, I don't, they're amazing. That's why. I wish I could do that. Um, but wake-up calls are a big deal, and they're important. Now, when I think about a wake-up call, though, I don't think about my alarm on my nightstand. I think about the stuff God has done in my life to help me have my eyes open to, to something's got to be different. Something's got to change. I've had several of those kind of wake-up calls in my life. Uh, probably one of the more recent ones was a physical wake-up call. Those are very interesting. About three years ago, I was getting a physical uh, to keep my commercial driver's license, license so I can drive the church bus still. So every two years, you got to get a physical. And they always do a urine sample, not to talk about urine at church today, but uh, I guess we're going to do that. Uh, and it turns out it got flagged for something that wasn't quite right. And so they said, you know, probably not a big deal, just need to go get a follow-up blood test as well, get some lab work done. So I did that, and then they said, okay, yeah, so we, we got the results, and it verified what we saw in the urine analysis. So we now need to do an ultrasound of your liver and pancreas. I'm like, so I keep saying he's probably fine, but now I've got an ultrasound. I've never had an ultrasound on my belly before. I thought that was weird, uh, but it just doesn't feel like it's fine. And as it turns out, I had, I don't even remember, I don't even know how to describe what was going on, but I had two things that were off that were levels. I know one of them was an enzyme. Maybe they both were. I don't know. Uh, I should probably remember that so I don't do that again. Don't let that happen again. Uh, but what was funny about it was uh, my doctor at the time was Dr. Gary Melton, who goes to church here, and he was my physician for, for many years before he retired. He said, Bill, one of these readings indicates that you've been excessively fasting, you know, not eating. I said, well, that ain't true. <laughs> And they said, the other reading shows that you've been really exercising intensely. I said, well, that ain't true. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on, but none of those are accurate at all. Long story short, a lot of it was dietary. It was some nutritional issues. And if you were to meet my family, you would know that my family, uh, they have this high metabolism gene, which lulls you into many decades of eating whatever you want until that metabolism kind of turns off a little bit in your 40s. And then next thing you know, you got a food baby. And that's what was going on with me. Uh, and so I was like, man, that, that really woke me up. I mean, I wasn't in a bad place and there wasn't any like horrible diagnosis. Uh, but I was like, okay, this is a new thing. I don't want anybody saying you've got to get an ultrasound of your liver anymore. Uh, so I made some changes in my lifestyle and my eating habits a little bit. That was a wake-up call that I had. But I've had many other ones, and they're, they wake you up. They, they put you on an edge. They help you to see that something's got to change. I've had some, I would call, relational wake-up calls where I've come to understand that I've got to make some changes in order to be a better husband, in order to be a better father. I've had spiritual wake-up calls. Probably the biggest one was the ultimate one back in the summer of 1988 when I came to realize this Jesus I knew so much about was actually not my Savior because I had yet to say yes to him. And that was my wake-up call. It was time to say yes to Christ. And I've had other spiritual wake-up calls since then. Here's what happens, though. There's a lie that's been spread since the beginning of time, since the beginning of, of humanity, really, that we cannot change. It's a, it's a lie that we embrace. Many of us believe this lie. We give up because of that lie. We give in because of that lie. We think it's too late for us. Or we think we're too far gone or we've done too much for God to be perhaps okay with us. So many of us believe the lie that we can't change. 
I believe that is a cow. We've been talking about cows that we follow instead of God. And if you're new here today, you're thinking, what? (laughs) We're talking about cattle now? What's going on? Uh, We began this series five weeks ago where we looked at a story of how the Israelites built, created, and fashioned a golden statue of a cow that they worshiped instead of God. And as silly as that sounds, and probably nobody in this room has done that or is doing that, if you are, it's not good. Don't do that anymore. God does not like that, all right? Don't worship a statue. But what we do instead is we allow these subtle ideas and concepts to be embraced by our hearts and our minds, and we follow that instead of God it's very subtle and that's why I think this has been such an important series for us is because it creeps not only into just culture culture in general human nature in general it creeps into church life as well we can be thinking that you know I I go to church very often and uh, man so I think I'm good and I'm even reading the Bible a little bit and here there whatever and as it turns out you can when confronted with these cows we create your eyes might be open you may be woken up to something you need to experience as far as change in your life goes. Just a quick recap, let me list to you the the cows we've talked about. We talked about seems right, that moral relativity, where we just do what feels right, seems right to us. We're not sure if it is right, but we just do it anyway. That's a cow we create. Feels good. Well, it makes me feel good to do it. It's pleasurable. And some of you are saying, oh, I would never do that because you're thinking all these top sins that are probably pleasurable that we shouldn't do. But sometimes it's more subtle than that. Sometimes it's the pursuit of the American dream. Sometimes it's the pursuit of, pursuit of success that becomes a God for us rather than God himself. We talked about can't wait. And to follow God will cause us to have to delay gratification. Instead, sometimes we can't wait. So we... Go past God's timing in our life and get what we want. And that goes against the will of God. Causes trouble for us. Last week we talked about they love me. The approval and opinion of others and how that becomes a driving force in our lives. That becomes a God that we follow instead of God himself. Today's cow and the last one we're talking about in this series is can't stop. We buy into that lie that we can't stop. We've tried, but we can't stop. Or maybe we haven't tried. Maybe we don't want to try. We can't stop. We can't stop drinking. We can't stop shooting up. We can't stop being depressed. We can't stop being abusive. We can't stop being angry. We can't stop looking at pornography. We can't stop being a workaholic. We can't stop lying. We can't stop being sexually active. We can't stop gossiping. We can't stop doing what our friends and coworkers and classmates expect us to do. They they expect this out of us. But friends, I want to tell you, with Jesus' help, not only can you stop, you can start. You can start living a new life. You can start experiencing the abundant life he has for you. You can start living out the purpose he has specifically for you in your life. That's something I'm living proof of because I've had some wake-up calls that put me on that path. And I believe in this very room, I I see some people that I know better than others that are known for years that I could bring up here and they could tell you their story and their life is living proof that you can dismantle the cow if can't stop and experience God's purpose for your life. But we're going to look at the true story of a man in the Bible that was able to see the cow of can't stop dismantled in his life. And he himself is living proof that that's a lie, that you can't stop. So if you have your Bible, we're going to look at Acts chapter 9 together. And we're going to look at the first 22 verses. We'll have the verses on the screen. So if you don't have a copy of the Bible, we'll have them up there. You can follow along in the church app if you want as well. The person we're going to read about is a man named Saul of Tarsus. Which I always get cracked up how they do names in the Bible. Uh, It's very common, you don't really see last names in the Bible. So they will say, your name and then where you're from. Or they'll say, your name and who's your daddy? <laughs> Something like that. Like, so, so I would be, this is really cool. Like I'm, I'm, I've been in Northern Kentucky in like 25 years now. So I feel like I'm more from here than being from Harlan County where I'm from. But 
the, the place I lived in Harlan County and grew up is Sand Hill, little, little bit of little community between uh, Cumberland and Harlan. So I would be Bill of Sand Hill. I think it has a nice ring <laughs> to it, you know. I like that. I'm more Bill of Independence now, though. But the man we're going to talk about is Saul of Tarsus, but you know him as the Apostle Paul. He had a little name change later. Sometimes God changed somebody so much, they just went in and changed their name too. And that's what happened to Saul of Tarsus. God used the Apostle Paul to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the nations, to the Gentiles, to those who were not Jews, to those who were not born and raised Israelites. He had a big role in the whole history of Christianity. God used the Apostle Paul to plant new churches in places that would be Europe and Asia today. God used the Apostle Paul to write 14 of our 27 books of the New Testament. So he's pretty much like a big deal, right? He's a hero. The Apostle Paul, greatest missionary, greatest church planter to have ever walked the face of the earth. But before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus which meant he was public enemy number one to Christianity. Yet he was the hero of Judaism, those who walked by the Jewish faith. And we're going to see that played out here. We're going to see this story of how he went from Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. Starting in verse 1 of Acts 9, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, all right? So that's where he was, breathing out murderous threats against everybody who follows Jesus. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, and that's a nickname they gave to those who followed Jesus back in the first century. They were part of this movement called the way. Probably something that the believers called themselves because of what Jesus said in John 14, 6, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if they found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now, I love this verse. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. I can almost hear this guy saying, Say what, God? (laughs) The poster child of all that is against Jesus, all that opposes the movement of the way, all that opposes Christianity, all that opposes the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, all abides in this man named Saul of Tarsus. It was okay to dislike this man. It was okay to hate this man. It was okay to demonize this man because he was the one who held the clothing of Stephen, one of the first deacons in the Bible, while they stoned him to death. That was Saul. And Saul speaks out to, or God speaks out to Ananias and says, go to him, lay your hands on him, 
restore his sight. <laughs> and Ananias is like, you crazy, God. <laughs> In verse 15, he says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. In that one little verse, we learn that Paul, eventually Saul becoming Paul, was going to suffer a lot as he lived out his purpose for Christ. And he did. If you read the rest of the book of Acts, you'll see that. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, I love this, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Talk about a flip of the switch. Talk about changing teams, right? And it says in verse 21, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he that guy? Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name, the name he's preaching? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. What a transformation, right? It's huge. I want to give you a truth that I believe we find in Saul's story that I want you to leave here with today and never forget it. Now, it's traditional in a lot of churches, including this one, that when the preacher says something good or true, somebody might feel a little, like, pumped about it and say, amen, all right? Oh, good practice. Thank you, brother. So I, I, I don't discourage that here. That's fine. Now, we, a few years back, started another little tradition that if the preacher says something that is blatantly obvious, so obvious that not only is it good and true, it's like, come on, man, like, we know this. Instead of saying amen, you can say, duh, all right? I consider that a worshipful thing to do in church because I hope you hear some duh statements at church because we sometimes need to be reminded of the truth. <laughs> that was pretty good, actually. Huh? Uh, just thought of that. <laughs> um, so I want to give you some truth here, and you just react however you feel led to react. You ready? Jesus can change anyone. All right? He can change anyone. And if you have any doubt whatsoever, then you're doing what we often do with the Bible. We sterilize it. We pretty it up. I mean, you, you see Saul, right? You see who he is? I mean, we know that he becomes the Apostle Paul and one of the greatest Christ followers to have ever lived, a hero of the faith. God inspired him to write down his very word. I mean, he's a big deal and he's a hero of the faith. Are you kidding me though? Do you see what he did before? I mean, he wreaked havoc. He was having Christians arrested, murdered, silenced. That's who he was. And you look through all the scripture, I see a lot more of that than we're willing to recognize. The rap sheets that some of the heroes of the faith had we're big. Jesus can change anyone. And you may be sitting there saying, but wait. You don't know me. Or you don't know this person I'm related to. <laughs> or you don't know this coworker I have. Or you don't know this friend I have. Maybe saying, I'm an addict. Or they're an addict. I'm an adulterer. Or everybody thinks I'm a great guy, but they don't know I secretly look at porn all the time. I have an alcohol problem. I have a criminal record that no one in this room knows about 
And if I can help it, they'll never know about it. I can't stop lying. I don't believe in God, and I'm not sure I ever will. I don't believe I can be convinced. Or I have so much anger, or I'm so depressed. And I say to you, so? What I see in God's word, I say to you, so? You telling me that Jesus can't change that? Baloney. That's a Greek word for no. <laughs> it's not true. The lie that we can't stop is a lie perpetuated from the beginning of humanity. And we still buy into it. We still buy into it. And we create a cow that we follow that says can't stop. I had uh, one of the ladies that was in the first service uh, talk to me about this. And they started talking about people in their life that has not changed that needs a change, and they're praying for them. And they said, I was reminded that I need to keep praying for them because Jesus can change anyone. And I immediately had a flashback to when I gave up praying for my own dad. And I prayed intensely for him to experience change in his life. And I gave up because I didn't see any indication that there would ever be a change. And I remember when he told me that he walked down and talked to a preacher at his mom's church, my grandma's church, and asked, can God even forgive me for what I've done? Which is music to a preacher's ears. And that preacher said, absolutely yes. You just gotta ask him. And he asked him, and that man has changed. When he told me that, I was super pumped, and then I was super convicted because I, I kinda quit praying for my dad. If I did, it was like, whatever you can do for him, God. I mean, you know, kinda one of those little, throw up a little, prayer every now and then I'm reminded of this incredible truth as you look at Saul's life I mean he's hopeless in a very unique way like it's one thing to be hopeless and you're like you look in the mirror or you look at someone else's life and they are they're struggling with years of addiction or maybe they're they're just totally mad and angry at everybody and there's no semblance of love or joy or or they they, they are convinced that there is no God and they will argue you to the teeth that that's true. And you're looking at that or you're, maybe that's you and you're looking in the mirror and you're seeing that and you're like, there's just no way that that can change. What's interesting about Saul of Tarsus is that we, we have every reason to believe that he doesn't even want to change. Why would he want to change? He was a hero. Uh, he was very into what he was doing. As far as he was concerned, he was spiritually in the right for what he was doing. He was obeying God to do what he was doing, right? This is how big his hopelessness was. And when he looked at himself in the mirror, he didn't say, wow, I just need change in my life. He looked in the mirror, he says, I'm gonna go get me some Christians today. We're going to take them down. I'm going to arrest me some. I'm going to kill me some. I'm going to silence me some. And uh, 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 praise to Jehovah God that I'm going to get it done. That's what he did. As far as we know, he didn't even want to change. And in addition to that, the people, his constituents, his posse, the people that were surrounding him in his life, all the circles of his life, they praised him. He was a hero to them. So why would you even want to change? <laughs> That's how hopeless he was. It's one thing to need to change and know you need it, but don't think you can have it. That's a bad place. It's another thing to need to change, don't think you need it, never want it, and believe that spiritually you should never change. That's the worst kind, actually. That's the worst kind. But Saul had a moment. And I would say this to you, man. When the light of Jesus blinds your life, it changes everything. It changes everything. He had, Saul had a spiritual wake-up call. And I believe he offers that to everybody. I believe he offers it to every single person. I believe that God offers a wake-up call to every single person. 
I believe that with all my heart. It may not be a blinding light like Saul got on the road to Damascus. It might be, it may look, and it usually looks completely different for everybody. For some of you, it might be just that little whisper of God's voice in your life telling you it's time to change. For some of you, it might be bigger than that. For people I know, their wake-up call can be something, even though it's physical, it's also spiritual. You know what I'm saying? Like, they kind of hit a physical rock bottom, but they recognize that God needed them to get on their back so that they can finally look up to him. I know so many people that have been through that. For others, it's different than that. It's sort of a rock bottom relationally when all of a sudden they feel completely alone and, and, and that there's complete severance from the people around them in their life and they feel lost and they don't know where to turn and that's finally when they may turn to the one living person that's been chasing after them for so long. Maybe that's yours. Maybe you sitting in this service and the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of your heart right now is your wake-up call. Here at 11969 Taylor Mill Road instead of the Damascus Road. I don't know, but I will tell you this. I believe with all my being that God offers a wake-up call to everybody, everybody. And I wonder, what if Saul had not answered his wake-up call? I wonder about that sometimes. Because this is how you dismantle the cow. It's not complex at all. You don't have to produce a wake-up call for your life. God will do that for you. Saul did not have to create a blinding light from heaven. His people didn't have to do that. That's God. God will do that. He'll do that part. Here's all you have to do to dismantle the cow of can't stop in your life. Follow the wake-up call God has given you. He gives it to you. You just got to follow it. Don't ignore it. Don't walk away from it. Don't pretend it didn't happen. Don't explain it away. Follow it. That's all you got to do. You don't have to create the wake-up call. You just got to follow it. But I wonder, what if Saul, because he didn't have to follow the wake-up call. I mean, I would make the argument, how could you not follow it? Because, man, if I go out of here and I have a blinding light on Madison Pike and I hear the voice of Jesus, I'm going to tell you, I hope I will do exactly what that voice tells me. <laughs> but he didn't have to. You know what I believe? If Saul had not followed the wake-up call in his life, he would have died a blind, angry shell of a man. That's what I believe with all my heart. He would have stayed blind because he didn't follow the wake-up call. I mean, God's part of his plan was that he'd be blinded temporarily so Ananias could come wake him up, but not only wake him up physically, but he would be awakened spiritually as well. He wouldn't have experienced that. And here's what I know. And maybe you've met these folks in your life. Maybe you've been this person. When I meet someone whom God has obviously tried to wake up, but they've explained it away and they've ignored it and they've gone this way instead of that way. They are some of the most miserable people I've ever met. And I'm not trying to throw shade on them. I'm not trying to say something mean. They just are. Because when you run away from God, that's what happens. When you ignore the wake-up call of God in your life, that's what happens. It might be a very subtle miserableness. You may look completely fine to everybody on the outside, but in that silent, quiet place when it's just you and your conscience and your heart and your thoughts, and if you recognize his presence, God, that's when the loneliness sits in. That's when you realize, I need to change even if nobody else thinks I do. That's when you know it. Follow the wake-up call God has given you. And that's what he does. When you look at what Jesus said, it's really interesting to go read Jesus' first encounters with people. That's a good little fun study to go. Go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and just read his first encounters with people. It is the most intriguing thing. But probably the most common thing you'll see are these three words. Come, follow, me and that has never changed 
it's still what he asks. It's still what he says to you in the midst of your wake-up call is, hey, you, come, follow me. Come, follow me. It's up to you to do that, though. That is your choice. And when Saul did that, he went from Damascus Road to Straight Street to a street preacher in a matter of days. That's the change that God does, and it's only the beginning. He continued to change and grow and become everything God created him and died for him to become. And friends, your story is no different. Your wake-up call might look different. The words and the commands specifically in your life that God gives you may look different. And the role that you play in God's kingdom may look different than anybody else's, but I'm here to tell you, it's the same story. That God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you, and if you would just believe in him and come follow him, he will do his grand purpose for your life in you and through you. It's the same story. It's not complex at all. We make it complex. Uh, The enemy, I think, wants to complicate Christianity, complicate life. It's not that complicated. Saul just got the wake-up call and he followed it. And that's the invitation you have today. The Bible calls those who believe in Jesus the church. We're also referred to as the body of Christ or the bride of Christ Treasured possession, the people of God are known as the church. I'm going to give you a public service announcement about the church today, all right? You ready? I'm going to read it to you. We are the church, a group of people who went from hell-bound sinners to heaven-bound saints. Join us. Wide open. Come be a part of that. I wish I could put a bunch of speakers outside these walls and re-say that. And I wish those speakers were connected to speakers at Kroger and because yeah, that's where everybody is on Sundays, apparently. <laughs> all over Independence, all over Kitten County, where 85% are unchurched and may not know this good news, that we simply are a group of people that changed from hell-bound sinner to heaven-bound saint. And we didn't change because of a self-help book. We changed because of a man named Jesus. And he can change anyone. And here's how. The Bible says in John 3, 16, that God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We just have to believe, guys. We just have to put our hand in the hand of Jesus and say, okay, it's yours. I'm yours. And the scales will fall from your eyes. And you take a step of obedience and another step of obedience, one moment, one day at a time. And the next thing you know, when you look in the mirror, you see somebody that wasn't the same as they were a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago. That's what Christ does. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's Jesus. Every single week of this series, we've said to you that whatever we talk about here on Sunday should change your Monday. If the Lord tarries is coming and gives us a new day of life and we wake up in the morning, let me give you this. Do the new thing Jesus is leading me to do today. Do that new thing. Whatever that is. We don't have to wait till Monday morning. It might be right now that he wants you to do the new thing. And maybe that new thing is to finally call upon his name and be saved. Or maybe you've done that already, but you know that there's things in your life that still need to be changed. And you hear the wake-up call of the Holy Spirit right now saying, it's time to stop. And don't buy into the lie that you can't. It's time to stop and start new. And with my help, Jesus says, with my help, as you follow me, I will change you. But you got to trust him. You got to completely turn your life over to him 100%. Will you do that? Let's pray. God, I thank you for reminding us from your word today that we can experience your change, 
that you can and will break the chains that bind us to who we are now so that we can become everything you want us to be, Father. And so, Lord, right now, there might be someone in this room that heard the knocking of the Holy Spirit upon their heart saying, you've yet to trust in me. You've yet to believe in me. You've yet to call upon my name. And they desire your salvation. And right now, Father, may they pray, may they call out to you right now and just say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me of my sins. And take my life. Make it yours. And Father, if someone's praying that prayer right now, help them to know that they are about to experience a transformation in their life forever that only you can give. And for those who are already on that path and maybe have been for some time, maybe they've wandered off that path. Help them to know that it's never too late. They're never too far gone to stop and start again. May they hear you saying that to them today and take a step of faith with you. I ask it in the name that is above all names, Father, the name, the only name by which we may be saved, the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.